it, it really was touch and go, and it really was um, edgier seat time there. You know, we really didn't know what was going to happen, and the doctors, in a way, did steal us for the worst. Well, the phone call was just awful, and uh, his wife was in Dublin, and we had to get a word to her, and I couldn't ring her. So my wife went to her. And then she said, no, was that an accident? And so I said, oh, my God, is he dead? <laughs> you know? But, uh, <clears throat> um, she said, no, he's, you know, but, uh, so initially, yeah, it was a terrible shock, and then we just didn't know. We did, didn't know anything, because we couldn't communicate with him over there, so. You said to me, why are you dying? Uh, because you'd sign a piece of paper to do the surgery, and I said, well, it's like this, if you don't sign it, you will die, and if you do sign it, you may still die, because you're in a critical condition. Despite very limited medical facilities, Dr. Alexander Zakharenkov, the surgeon who operated that night, saved Duncan's life. Thank you. Спасибо. Спасибо вам. Если бы не ваш здоровый организм, ничего бы у нас не получилось. Thanks to you, because if you were not strong enough, so we wouldn't have you here, and your uh, heart, strong heart. I didn't expect her to be emotional, you know. And the nurses too. I remember his face. I remember looking down at me. A very kind man. Everybody remembers you, Duncan. And he just brought back a memory there, yeah. Duncan needed a ventilator to breathe at that stage because the damage around his ribs and to and uh, we know now, of course, his his, his lung was punctured and this type type of thing. So. Um, that ventilator was a rare commodity in that part of the world. And that they got their hands on it or that they were able to use it is, is nothing short of a miracle because anyone else had needed or been on that, then uh, Duncan's chances would have diminished a hell of a lot more. So with that and the, the, the tenuousness of his situation in Bragan Hospital, which is just a regional hospital, the, the doctors made the decision to transfer him by ambulance to a more main hospital in, in the city of Goma. The doctors there told me that he really should, should be dead. And when he woke up, he was surprised. And I don't think he realized whether he was alive or dead. My first, when I woke up, was this branch breaking off a tree, shearing off the tree, and me suddenly kind of jolting. I remember both my brother and my son, Marcus. Marcus and Marcus were here. And I don't know where they came from. I didn't know what was this, because what are they doing, and why are they looking down at me so sternly? And. Uh, that, uh, that gave me a fright that they were looking so sternly at me because I felt then there was something very seriously wrong. And uh, that's when I thought it was in a coffin. As far as I know, the air ambulance came from Germany. It looked like it would never work because one, they weren't sure he was safe to move and neither the, the hospital there were going to let him go if it, was, if it was unsafe. But they knew they couldn't keep him there because it was dangerous to keep him there. They admitted he wouldn't live if he remained. So we went to a very empty airport. There was nobody there. At the same time as being really annoyed and upset by everything, you're also laughing, because it's kind of like a, 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 some sort of comedy at some stage. He was on the runway. He had this little, tiny little thing covering his modesty, you know? And uh, jumpers, uh, Chernobyl Children's Project jumpers wrapped all around him, everything we could throw on him to keep him warm. I know it's a sub-zero. They then had to shift him, take the blankets off him, and put him onto the other one while he was lying almost uh, out of it. This was the most incredible scene. Once I got him on the air ambulance, I felt more comfortable. Yeah, I, th I thought it was, we're now getting him back. But of course, it's a long trip. And uh, I, I started to get more positive when we were getting closer to Dublin. You start building up an image of this. And you don't know whether there's any reality to this or whether it's all figment of your imagination or putting together little bits and pieces from what other people said. It puts it to rest in a way. I'm happy with that. That's good enough for me. Yeah, it's, it's worth doing what we did. Once the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, Belarus now imports most of its own food. Post Chernobyl, the stigma of contamination means that local produce is virtually impossible to sell. 
Food safety advice and government health warnings are largely ignored, especially by the poor, who in any case can't afford clean supermarket food. With his accident behind him, Duncan continued where he left off in 2003. Back then, he'd arranged to meet Professor Vasily Nesterenko, a nuclear physicist, working on, among other things, a way to reduce the harmful effects of eating contaminated food, a problem Duncan had seen at first hand in Jitkovici. In the last two years, Professor Nesterenko has made huge progress and was keen to share his findings. He says that it's not dangerous for... And you see, 90% of all the radiation people are getting now through food because uh, as the soil is contaminated, then uh, cesium-137 easily dissolves in water. And then it's like a cycle when uh, uh, wild animals or cows eat grass or any plants. So they, they absorb that radiation from the plants. And when we get milk, or other food products from farming. We absorb radiation. What is the work you've been doing here at your research institute, Professor? He would like to minimize the effects of the radiation in uh, the children's bodies. We realize that we need to do something to protect those kids and to teach them how to uh, eat good food. Just, just dry it up. Nothing yeah. else in it. No. Mm. And then, Working with a substance called pectin derived from apples, Professor Nestorenko discovered that it had a powerful detoxifying effect on human tissue. Travelling all over southern Belarus with a mobile unit, he tested a pectin supplement on children who'd been eating contaminated food. The results were impressive. Those who took the supplement had 40% of the radiation removed from their bodies. This is a cure for it, is it? It's kind of a natural cleanup for the body because when it gets into your system, it absorbs uh, heavy metals like cesium uh, that were in, uh, in your stomach. The figure of 23 becquerels, is that high or low for this region? You see, this year, uh, the levels here are a bit lower, as uh, this year we didn't have mushrooms, and they usually go and pick mushrooms. This is something that's in people's culture, you know. They've been used to eating mushrooms and berries from the forest because that's what they need, because they have a very poor existence here, and it's part of their stable diet. The reality is that this is doing good where it can get to, because at least it's advising children, it's advising their parents, it's getting to know the figures in terms of the average figures in a region, and it's also letting the people know that they can do certain things. They can, for example, not take certain foodstuffs. They can use pectin tablets at certain situations that will help. They can change food habits in terms of what they grow and what they can buy in from other regions. This is the food they eat every day of their life. And this dosage builds up all the time in their system.